Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. Mm -hmm. We are well past the halfway mark in the book of Psalms, and we'll be doing, of course, Proverbs, Song of Solomon after that. So these are some exciting uh, times in our daily Bible study. And we're just looking forward to these. I love the, the Psalms because they're so pastoral in nature. They're just direct encouragement from the heart of God. And today we'll be looking at Psalm 85 and 86. Now, uh, being Friday, I want to ask you to make the effort to share the Morning Light Daily Bible Study with your friends. You can tell them to search for Father's Heart Ministry on the Android market or the iPhone market because we have a custom app just for the broadcast. They can also go to propheticnow.com and see the written version of the study. And there's a link there to the audio broadcasts also. And just to share the studies with others to be a benefit to them. We've had testimonies from around the world. I'll never forget when we were in um, Northern Ireland, uh, a little lady came up to me uh, at a meeting. We were at an Elam church mm -hmm. ministering uh, just over the line from Northern Ireland to Ireland. And this uh, diminutive little lady came up. She looked like a librarian and shook my hand and and she said, I just want you to know that uh, two weeks ago I gave my life uh, to Jesus and everything has changed for me and it's all because of morning light and she just appreciated it. And we've all, We're also doing the newexpectations.net evangelism initiative and seeing hundreds of people coming to Christ. Many of them are getting born again for the very first time Others are rededicating their life to Jesus, and we're giving resources to them and praying with them and assigning intercessors to them. Uh, because the Lord told us to begin to do in evangelism what we've been doing now for many years in regard to prophetic ministry. And having said that, it's just a, a testimonial, a report back to those of you that support us that we may make every effort to be good ground. To be good ground in the gospel. And having said that, I just want to say thank you to our partners. Uh, it's been back in 2013, God gave us a vision for 500 partners. We reach literally like 80, just under 9,000 people every single day through uh, the website, propheticnow.com. And out of that, now you multiply that by the number of days and how many people that are reached and touched. And out of that, we have fewer than 500 partners. So it's a very elite group and one that is extremely appreciated at your giving and your generosity. Uh, it becomes quantified and its value established by the testimonies. You can look on the website at all of the testimonies of people responding and saying what a benefit it is to their life. And so you can go to propheticnow.com and click on the donation link. You can make a one-time donation. You can make that donation a monthly donation and thus become a partner with us. And we just thank you. The partnerships make it possible for us to listen to God, go where he tells us to go. You know, sometimes there's a, there's a financial aspect to everything. And if we feel like we're supposed to go to... Europe and minister, which we have done, uh, normally you'd have to sit down and think, okay, well, that's fine, but we've got to be able to to underwrite that that effort. Well, because of our partners, we've never had to stop and think, no, we can't do that because mm -hmm. we can't afford it. Mm -hmm. Or no, if we're going to do that, we've gone to Europe and did it just small group meetings all over the United Kingdom without thinking about whether or not the offerings would be big enough to support what God was telling us to do. And it's partners that make that possible, that we can make decisions without respect 
to is this something we can afford to do or to the poor. It's one thing God's really been telling me. Make an effort to give to the poor. When you give to the poor, you're lending to the Lord. Our first priority in giving should be giving to the poor. The Levites gave 15.6% of their income to the poor. You look that up, you do a little study, and you'll find that's true. And uh, see, giving to the poor is what validates other giving. When you're giving into the work of God, giving into the ministry that blesses you. A lot of people say, I give, I tithe, I do these things, and it doesn't seem to be working for me. But I've also questioned some of those people and suggested they do something for the poor, and they say, no, I'm not giving to the poor. They'll just go spend it on alcohol. Well, you really need to start thinking differently about that. Give to the poor. When you give to the poor, you authenticate what you give elsewhere. And when you give to the poor, you are authenticating what you give elsewhere. We have got to begin. That may not be what's being done in uh, Christian culture, but as for you, you have to make a decision. You're going to start prioritizing, making a priority of giving to the poor. And then when you give to the poor, you give to the poor out of your surplus. When you give to the poor out of your surplus, God will make sure that you stay in surplus. Did you hear what I just said? When you give to the poor out of your surplus, God will make sure you stay in surplus. If you remember how uh, Ruth gleaned in Boaz's fields, in other words, she was gleaning his surplus. When you give to the poor out of your surplus, God will keep you in surplus. But then in giving to ministry purpose, you give out of your need. The word there with the widow with the two mites was penury, which meant deep poverty. Now, how do you give out of deep poverty? No matter what your so, your financial condition is, giving out of your deep poverty looks like this. You listen to the Holy Ghost, you give what He tells you to, and it's one of those gifts that, you know, keeps you laying awake at night thinking, I sure hope that's God because if it's not, I'm in trouble. And what happens then as you give to the poor and you then give out of your penury into ministry purpose, all of a sudden your money begins to move by the Spirit. It's one thing I've found, I have so learned from God in years past, and God put me in the business world. I learned I could hear from God, wake up in the night, and hear something very simple that God would tell me to do, and my business would explode with growth. The one time God whispered to me in the night, I implemented what He said. It was a strategy that cost me nothing, and my business exploded 800%. There is When God partners with you in a business, let me tell you something. And that is a, a testimony by which God used means. God gave me wisdom. I acted on it. My business grew. That's one way God works. But then there is a direct uh, dynamic that God activates. is when you take your money and begin to handle it the way God tells you to, then you come out of the economy of man into the economy of God. And by the sheer principles of giving, sowing and reaping. Do not ever let a contaminated, ignorant, uninformed, religious mentality tell you that it's wrong to give expecting something in return. Because the scripture says from Genesis to Revelation that giving, and Jesus when he spoke about it, was always about sowing out and expecting to reap back, just like a farmer. You go tell a farmer, you're just farming so you can get a crop. <laughs> He'd think you're too bri- you know, a few bricks shy of a load. Well, of course you are. God wants you to. He wants you to understand that as you give and you respond to God, you listen to His voice and act, and act promptly. If you take a passive or tepid attitude and you fold your arms and say, well, I'll think about that, God folds His arms. Your angels fold their arms. And they say, well, okay, well, we'll just think about that. That's what we're doing. We're thinking about it. Let your response respond quickly. Respond quickly. Respond promptly. Respond with a large largesse of of heart, not a stingy heart. Mm -hmm. Because you're operating, in in finances, you're operating the law of sowing and reaping. And if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. And so you want to be big-hearted toward the poor, big-hearted toward ministry purpose, and the, the pace at which you respond to God establishes the pace at which He responds to you. 
And trust me, as much as I appreciate what I learned in business, and God taught me so many things in business, and I just loved it. Every day was an adventure. Everything, every time we did what God said, in the midst of a really bad economy, every time we did what God said, it was the growth was explosive and the blessing was huge. But giving is just another way when you get involved in handling your money according to the economy of the kingdom, then your money begins to move by the Spirit and things take place that are absolutely supernatural. And so I say, well, what do I give? you got to get that from the Holy Ghost. you got to get that from the Holy Ghost. And be sure to authenticate your giving by first giving to the poor. Do not give into ministry purpose unless you are also giving to the poor. Because giving to the poor authenticates what you give otherwise. And what do you give? You listen to the Holy Ghost and you do what he said. Mm -hmm. If tithing works for you, that's fine. But learn to get beyond the 10% solution also. I know I've had experiences where I went for years giving 70% of my income into the gospel. And uh, uh, I was like, oh, you can't afford to do that. And I told him, no, I, I can't afford not to. Because God, that's what God was telling me to do at the time. For most of, of my adult life, I've given upwards of 30% of my income into the gospel. He said, well, how can you possibly do that? You know, because it's doing what you see the Father do. It's not operating a principle. It's responding in obedience. Listen to the Holy Ghost. And in this case, go to the West. Say, well, you're just asking for, for your ministry. Absolutely. It takes, it takes, we're like everybody else. We've got electricity. We have cars we drive. We have, you would be astounded at the expense it takes to, to reach 8,000 people every single day. Uh, it's it's very demanding, very costly, and we just listen to what God says and we do it. We listen to God and obey Him, and people out there just like you are listening to God and obeying Him, and we're able to continue this, and maintain our employees. It's You know, there may come a day that I'll come on the broadcast and say, we're in trouble, folks. I need you to give in to our need. I don't believe it. But you know what? <laughs> uh, I, and that's the point I'm making is don't ever despise the ministry that says they're struggling and wants you to give. When you despise somebody in their in their need, you're going to find yourself being despised in your need. Don't ever. I know it's that picture of stereotypical picture of a preacher whining for money. Don't ever despise that person. Don't you ever do it. Sometimes you give to a need. Sometimes you give to an anointing. What I'm inviting you to do is to give to an anointing. When you give to an anointing, it will produce in your life your version, God's version in your life of what it's producing in the life of those that you're ministering toward and giving toward. So listen to the Holy Ghost and go to propheticnow.com and click on the donate link and, and obey God. And you're going to be astounded at what happens. It's the one thing that the prophet prophesied does in 09. God said, I'm going to show you how money moves by the Spirit. Well, you know, we were not in surplus at the time. But from that day till this, one of the greatest rejoicings of my heart is the principles by which we share when it comes time to talk about giving. It's, it's one of the greatest adventures as we do things that may not make sense from a fiscal standpoint, may not make sense from the purpose of, you know, budgeting and all of this. We're just simply listening to God and doing what he said, and he provisions us as he will provision you. And your money will begin to move by the Spirit, and you'll begin to see some things happen in your life that will bring great rejoicing. Mm -hmm. It's how you get on a fixed income. <laughs> so, fixed by heaven? Oh, I'm on a fixed income, Brother Walden. Pray glory to God, <laughs> Jesse Duplantis says. Let's get our income fixed in the kingdom. How about that? Amen. Now, today we're studying in Psalm. And thank you so much for your giving. Thank yeah, you for thank you for you. bearing with us on Friday when we talk about money. We don't talk about it throughout the week. And thank you for bearing with us, and being patient, and being responsive as well. We got two new partners yesterday, sweet, on one day. That's always exciting. Thank you for that. And today is Psalm eighty-five and eighty-six, praying through delays. In these two chapters, we see the importance of praying through seeming delays in deliverance. We often fall prey to the intimidation of Satan against us in a time of pressure and trial. The enemy wants us to think that he's all-powerful, 
But I want you to understand there are boundaries that God will never allow Satan to cross. Uh, Satan is not equal yet opposite to God. Uh, the practical application of most Christian theology suggests that. Now, if you ask them directly, they'll say, well, of course not. But yet, they, the, with the way they talk about it, they think of uh, God and Satan as polar opposites, as though somehow Satan is equal yet opposite to God, and no, he is not. Uh, Jesus taught ongoing, consistent, faith-filled prayer as a key to deliverance. As we maintain faithfulness in the midst of difficult situations, the answer will never fail to come. And one of the questions we're going to answer today is, is it wrong to, to ask more than once for something from God? In other words, it's been said that the first time you ask, that's in faith. The second time you ask is unbelief. Mm -hmm. And that's a very widespread uh, belief, and more so perhaps in the past than it is than it is now. Why don't you tell the story about the prophetic word you got about that? About uh, uh, you've asked and you've asked, and the Lord's heard those. Yeah, uh, it was a Christian International one year. She said, uh, "You've sowed and you've sowed, and you've asked the Lord over and over." And the Lord says, "I keep hearing that request over and over." And He said, "I have answered that request." You can rest now. I've answered that request. Your blessing time has come. She's a little Irish prophet. Your blessing time has come. The Lord hath heard you. <laughs> you don't need to keep praying the prayer over and over again. She said. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's what the old timers used to know about. Uh, used to talk about praying Pretty through. Sure. It's birthing in prayer. You know, when a lady has a baby, she doesn't just have one massive contraction no. and bear the baby, it <laughs> takes time. Right. Multiple contractions. And sometimes she has to and sometimes she has to bear down and other times she has to breathe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's the Lamaz version <laughs> of uh, intercessory prayer. Uh, Kitty, if you begin by reading Psalm eighty five, one through thirteen. Sure. Okay, to the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah, Lord thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people, and thou hast covered all their sins, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what the Lord, what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. I like that. Righteousness will go before you. Righteousness, from a New Testament perspective, is God has made Jesus to be your righteousness. 1 Corinthians one thirty. Now, in 1 Corinthians one thirty, we understand that your righteousness is a person. That means God accepts you because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for you. In the Old Testament, God accepted you because you were born of uh, the lineage of Abraham and were compliant with the law. And the law was your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ so that you realize that you can't live up to it, therefore you need a Savior. In Christ, the righteousness that goes before us is Jesus himself. And I love what he says, Lord, you've been favorable to our land. And it, you can see that. Sometimes the favor of God is on the land. Other times uh, we're experiencing something else. But uh, you can see the favor of God upon your land. What does that look like? In Genesis chapter 26, we find Isaac in a time of famine when people were dying, starving to death. And God told uh, Isaac, stay in this land 
And he stayed in the land, and he sowed in the land in a time of famine, and reaped a hundredfold return in the same year. While everybody who was starving to death, everybody who had buried their their family members who had starved to death, were looking on, having done the same things, and not understanding why Isaac was so blessed. But he received a hundredfold return in the same year. And when God tells you to do something, you don't have to do a feasibility study as to what everybody else is doing, because you're going to have results that nobody else will have. When I first opened my business years ago, uh, I was laughed to scorn by the, the others that were in my business. They put the word out that there's no way Russell Walden was going to succeed because it, it, there was not a lot of room for a new business, a new IT business in my county. I was in a very small town. They predicted I wouldn't be open more than two weeks. Well, guess what? I put all of them out of business. And then there was a new crop that came around, uh, business, IT businesses, and I saw all of them go out of business. And in the years I was doing what I did, I saw every IT business in my county, in various cities and towns, come into business and go out of business. And I was still standing, and guess what? Well, that business is still producing today. Mm -hmm. My son has it, and he's carrying it on, because we did what God said do. When you obey God, you, there's no point doing the feasibility study because God's going to be with you. And if everybody else fails, you will succeed. You can sell snowshoes in the Sahara Desert <laughs> if God tells you to because the Lord will be with you. Psalm 85 is dated by some to the return of the exiles from captivity. There, there's thankfulness in this psalm for returning from Babylon, but there's also mention of harassment from neighboring nations. These conditions existed both in Ezra and Nehemiah's time. Just because you've won a great victory does not mean the enemy will no longer harass you. Kitty says you cannot lay down in a war zone. Uh, the people have exited Babylon and returned to Jerusalem, but there are still nations around them seeking to intimidate and plague them with threats. So you realize how limited Satan is in what he can accomplish against you? The one complaint Satan had when he appeared before Job, before God regarding Job, is that God had put a hedge round about him. God would not let Satan at Job the way he wanted to. If Satan had his way unrestrained, he would snuff out all life on the planet in a moment of time and drag billions down into hell. But guess what? Satan doesn't get to have his way. God has placed restraining influences upon Satan to prevent him from doing what he wants to do to the degree he wants to do it in your life. In spite of this fact, we see portrayals of Satan in popular culture uh, that suggest he's this all-powerful, all-knowing uh, creature who is completely ungoverned by anybody. This is anything but the truth. Jesus told Peter in Luke twenty two twenty one that Satan desired to sift him as wheat. Guess what? That was news to Peter. <laughs> Peter didn't realize that. Jesus, however, prayed for him that his faith would fail not. This is a powerful example of divine protection. Peter had no idea he was such a target of the enemy. See, Jesus is praying for you, even regarding threats you are completely unaware of. Hebrews 7.5 says that he ever lives to make intercession for us. You will never know till you get to heaven how many answers to prayer Jesus has secured for us in perils that we were totally unaware of at the time. The greatest testimony in your life is going to be not what did happen, but what didn't happen that you weren't even aware of. And Jesus was informing uh, Peter, I know for myself, Whenever we travel and we're on the road a lot, we've crisscrossed the United States many times. And there have been times that I'd just tune in and I'd, I'd realize what the enemy's plan was. And I know the enemy tried to kill us in a car accident and tried to take our life. But guess what? God doesn't let that happen. Our greatest testimony, again, is not just what God did do, but it's what God did not allow the enemy to do. And then verse 2 talks about how the Lord had forgiven the iniquity of the people and covered their sin. Uh, the heart of God is to forgive and to cover sin. Now here is a legitimate understanding 
of a wholesome covering doctrine. Covering, as a theological subject in the scriptures, is about forgiveness, cleansing, and transformation by the efficacy of the shed blood of Calvary. Verse 3 says that God takes away wrath from us. How is this accomplished? How does God take wrath away from us? Once a year, the sins of the people were pronounced on the head of a scapegoat, and the scapegoat was led away and released into the wilderness. This represents Jesus taking our sins upon himself. See, God just doesn't decide to arbitrarily overlook sin. He doesn't look at you and wink and say, oh, that's okay, and pat you on the back. Mm -hmm. Something has to be done with sin. Sin has to be reckoned with. We take, tend to take a cavalier attitude about it. It's no big deal. God's just lenient. Actually, God is not lenient. He is so not lenient that in order to deal with the sin issue, he sent his only son. It is so important to God to deal with sin in our lives that he allowed his own son to come in the form of man and to be brutally crucified. Why? For one reason, and that's to get the sin out of our lives. That's how serious God is about So your sin doesn't just evaporate because God's like, oh, I know you didn't mean it. You're just kidding. It's all right. It's all good, mama bug. No, it's not all good. Sin has to be addressed. How does it get dealt with? By Jesus taking our sins upon himself. God's not arbitrarily overlooking sin. Sin is dealt with. Therefore, the wrath that God takes away from our lives, he takes it away because our transgressions have been imputed to Jesus so that his righteousness could then be imputed to us. Now, let me say this to you. All of the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus. If we believe this, then we must ask ourselves, does God have any wrath left? Did God pour all of his wrath out upon Jesus upon the cross? Is there any part of the wrath of God that he reserved and saying, Jesus, I'm going to brutally crucify you, turn my face from you on Golgotha, the sky will go dark, the earth will quake, you're going to go down into hell, but I'm going to keep some little portion of the wrath of God so I can punish my people when I need to. See, all these people are preaching wrath. The wrath of God are preaching a fiction. They're preaching uh, something that flies in the face of what God did in Christ on Calvary. See, if all of God's wrath was poured out upon Jesus, then he doesn't have any left. When we suffer, does that mean, oh, but we're suffering? Well, when we suffer, it isn't because God is suspending the merits of Christ in our behalf. We suffer not because God separates himself from us, but because we separate ourselves by disobedience. Even in the Old Testament, the prophet said, your sins have separated you from God. It's not God separating himself from you. See, therein lies our deliverance. If it's something we have done that separates us from God, it's something then we can do in casting ourselves at the foot of the cross and finding that cleansing and that covering that he speaks about in verse 2. That we can turn toward God and see a different result. Thank you, Father. So, Father God, I just ask that you would show us transgression. Show us those things in our life, Father God, that you are, that you have released affording grace and affording grace to change. Show us the attitudes in our heart. Show us the unbelief. Show us the, the compartmentalizations where we have hidden sins and secret iniquities that are, that are uh, entrenched in our heart, that's causing us to experience less than the fullness of all that Jesus died to provide. Lord, we ask for cleansing. We ask for cleansing from everything in our character and personality that is contrary to who Jesus is and who Jesus died. Lord, when you look at us, we want you to see the full purchase price of Calvary validated in our character validated in the sweetness of spirit and the purity of mind that we're walking in before you because we live in a contaminated world, a world that is contaminated by sarcasm, contaminated by pessimism, contaminated by negativity and ungodliness. 
But Father, we ask that you would purify us and give us the grace to engage by an act of our will, just as we engage an act of our will to separate ourselves from you by sin. God, show us how to engage with your grace in such a way that we are immersed in all uh, the transforming uh, grace that you've made available, that when you look at us, you see the reflection of yourself, you see of the travail of Christ on the cross, and see the satisfaction of your heart, and say, that's what I'm looking for in Lakeisha, that's what I'm looking for in Barbara, that's what I'm looking for in Cindy, and Kitty, and Russ, Mm -hmm. and Tim, that you would see, and then we manifest, not our own character, but we manifest the character of Christ. Psalm 86, Thank you for that, honey bunny. Psalm 86, a prayer of David. Bow down my ear, O Lord, and hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of trouble I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Among the gods there is none like thee. O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Amen to that. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God. With all my heart I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul, and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and grace, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. O turn unto me, and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant, and save the son of thy handmaiden. Show me a token for good, that they which hate me may see it, and be ashamed, because thou, O Lord, hast hope in me or helped me and comforted me. When David said he was delivered from the lowest hell, ask yourself the question, how do you wind up in hell? <laughs> Is it not our sins? If we if we wake up in hell, what puts us there? It's our sin. So what David is really saying is that the Father set him free from the consequences of his own action. I'll never forget uh, the pastor had a that I met one time. He had a beautiful wife, three lovely little little children, and he was struggling with a temptation to homosexuality. And he called me up one day, and he said, uh, I'm leaving my family. I'm leaving my family. I'm going into a homosexual relationship. And he said, I just want to know what you think about that. And boy, in the moment he said that, my first reaction was I was just going to uh, drop the bomb on him and just rebuke him and try and force him to do something different than what he was going to do. And the Lord spoke to my heart. I felt the fear of God come on me. And I, it was like, Russ, you're going to be judged by what comes out of your mouth next. And I remembered what Romans 2, 4 said, that it was the goodness of God that leads men to repent. And so I, I listened to that pastor and I opened my mouth and this is what I said. Uh, I said, you can make your bed in hell, but when you're in that place, just remember that God is with you. That doesn't mean God approved of what he did. That doesn't mean God accepted what he did. That means that God, as they say, is married to the backslider. God is married to those that even make terrible decisions. And like King David you can be delivered from the lowest hell, even if it is a hell of your own making. So Psalm 86 is a prayer of David for preservation, a prayer of David for mercy. In spite of being king over all Israel, David says, I'm poor and needy. This is a proper estimation of our position in life. No matter how secure we may think we are, 
Human wealth and standing in life is very fleeting. Things change. Situations change. But God's faithfulness remains the same. In verse 3, David petitions for the mercy of God and makes his prayer a daily effort. Notice what he says. Daily. I cry unto you daily. Some have taught that the first time you ask is in faith, but if you continue to ask, you're in unbelief. That is incorrect, and we want to kick over that sacred cow in our broadcast today. In John 16, 24, Jesus said, Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Ask. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. God is never offended when you ask him for something. In natural relationships, asking for something can put a strain on a friendship. If you want to terminate even a close friendship, make the mistake of loaning money or ingratiating that friend to you in some way. Almost always that leads to estrangement. On the other hand, when you ask God for something, he invites you to keep on asking. He's happy that we have asked. Now, let me read you that verse in the Amplified, John 16, 24. He says, ask and keep on asking. In other words, the tense of the verb properly translated isn't just about asking. It's about ask and keep on asking and you will receive so that your joy may be full and complete. So, verse 7 tells us, he said in uh, our psalm, he said, In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, and you will answer me. In other words, when you're in trouble, call upon the Lord, he's going to answer. And if he doesn't answer you, then his word is a lie, and we can all take our Bibles and just throw them in the dumpster. He will. It doesn't say, well, I know somebody who is in trouble, and, and God didn't answer them. You cannot allow somebody else's experience or your experience to speak louder than the authority of God's word. That if we call upon him in the day of trouble, he's going to answer. We often question God's timing. We think God is delaying. You know, Daniel prayed and he waited many days till the angel showed up with the information he asked for. In Daniel 10, 12, and 13, the angel showed up. Daniel had been praying for a long time. And the angel showed up and said, Fear not, Daniel, for the very first day that you set your heart to understand, your words were heard, and I am come for your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. In other words, the angel told him, Daniel, your prayer was answered the moment it came out of your mouth. But there was resistance. The enemy doesn't want answered prayer to reach you. That's why you ask and keep on asking. Do you understand? It's not that God isn't hearing. God answers you immediately. But it's the ongoing corridor of your faith that opens the way and brings the angels that are somehow mystically connected with bringing answered prayer to you. And so as you're praying, you are tethering yourself to the angel that has the answer to prayer that was dispensed to you in the moment that you prayed. Don't give up on your prayers. Ask and keep on asking. A very important clue and uh, to understanding about the nature of prayer. That is why... We ask, and we keep on asking. The enemy of your soul wants to prevent your prayer from being answered. But make no mistake, God hears and dispatches deliverance to you the day you ask. So brothers and sisters, refuse to despair. Know that God is working on your behalf. You will not be denied. You have not been denied or turned away when you ask in faith, trusting in the hand of God to move in your behalf. So God, I just ask you, Father, that you would reform our thinking where our prayer life is concerned. You would cause us to see what Jacob saw when he saw the ladder and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That, Father, that you would cause us to know that as we ask and keep asking, we're opening a corridor, the aperture of an open heaven that causes the angels to find uh, ingress and egress into our lives between us and the throne. And that we'll get, we'll get what it is to pray 
upon the earth that the answer might be dispatched from heaven. And we acknowledge, according to your word, that you hear us and you answer us the very day, the very moment it escapes our lips. And then we are a part of the process of birthing it through the corridor of our faith, uh, in, out of the womb of our hope, into manifest reality. So we just bless you today. I trust you're going to have a wonderful weekend. I just declare the blessing of God and the favor of God upon your land this weekend. This weekend is going to be a banner weekend for you. The goodness of God is just going to ambush you with every sweet blessing that you could possibly uh, imagine that God's going to surprise you with his goodness. You're going to revel in his grace and see the wonders of heaven made manifest to you in every avenue of your life this weekend. God bless you. We'll see you Monday.